Welcome to Around the Empire, the show that takes you around the U.S. Empire. I'm your host, Dan Wright. I'm your co-host, Joanne Leon. And on today's show, January 26, 2017, we speak to Robbie Martin, both about his film series, A Very Heavy Agenda, and what to expect from the Trump administration and the neoconservatives. But before we do that, here's Around the Empire. We begin our news from around the empire with the United States Central Command. U.S. and NATO troops in Afghanistan have two missions, Operation Resolute Support, a NATO train, advise, and assist mission, and Operation Freedom Sentinel, a U.S. counterterrorism mission. General John Nicholson, commander of the U.S. forces in Afghanistan and of NATO's Resolute Support mission, told the Senate Armed Services Committee about the situation in an exchange with Senator John McCain. In your overall commander's assessment, are we winning or losing? Mr. Chairman, I believe we're in a stalemate. Thank you. Um, And, of course, our Afghan partners have been sustaining very significant losses. And I'm not sure that's sustainable, the level of losses that the ANA is experiencing. And, Mr. Chairman, we're very concerned about the level of losses. Uh, The... The recurrent recruitment replaces the level of losses that they're experiencing. However, it does not allow them to get to their full authorized strength, which they are below. And it might be nice if they could come to the United States to train. How many more do you need to get this stalemate uh, reversed? Mr. Chairman, I have adequate resourcing in my counterterrorism mission. In my train, advise, and assist mission, however, we have a shortfall of a few thousand. Nicholson told the committee that Afghanistan has the highest concentration of terrorist groups anywhere in the world and said, quote, We remain very focused on the defeat of al-Qaeda and its associates, as well as the defeat of Islamic State Khorasan province, which is the ISIL affiliate in Afghanistan, unquote. In a press conference from Baghdad, Colonel John Dorian gave an update on the situation with the U.S. coalition operation on Raqqa in Syria and the overall progress against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Well, we continue working on the isolation phase to approach the city. Uh, This is a key part of the campaign. We're working that with the Syrian Democratic Forces in the Syria and Arab coalition. Uh, Raqqa is a city that the enemy uses for external operations. So what we would expect is that within the next few weeks, the city will be nearly completely uh, isolated, and then there will be a decision point uh, to move in. We're not going to give the exact timing of the uh, effort to uh, seize the city, uh, but we do believe that uh, excellent progress is being made and we will continue to pressure the enemy on multiple fronts. One of the key points here is that as, uh, as Raqqa is being isolated, the enemy is also under pressure in al-Bab. They're also under pressure from regime and Russian forces in Deir Zora and other areas around Syria. They're completely surrounded in Mosul. So what we see is the enemy being overwhelmed anywhere that they are. Um, it's too many problems for them to solve at any given time. And now we shift to United States Special Operations Command. There were new developments this week regarding the Navy SEAL raid in Yemen. The leader of AQAP, Qasim al-Rimi, survived the raid and then trolled the White House in an audio tape. Military and intelligence officials told NBC that al-Rimi was the target of the raid. Colonel John Thomas of CENTCOM had denied that it was a high-value target mission. NBC reported that the targets of the mission, quote, were alerted by something, possibly a barking dog, a drone crash, or walkie-talkie chatter, unquote. CNN said, quote, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula fighters detected the SEAL team before it reached its objective, leading to an intense firefight, unquote. Also via NBC, we learned that this mission had been in preparation for two months, and was part of a proposal to, quote, accelerate U.S. counterterrorism operations in Yemen. It was a large mission involving two dozen SEALs, 30 to 40 other Americans on the ground in the air, 
six Yemeni soldiers, 12 United Arab Emirates commandos, plus a Marine Corps quick reaction force was waiting offshore. Neither the Pentagon nor the White House have publicly announced it, but anonymous White House officials told the New York Times that Yemen will no longer allow U.S. special operations ground missions in Yemen. They will still allow drone attacks and American military advisors who are providing intelligence support to the Yemenis and forces from United Arab Emirates. And next we move to the United States European Command. The Ukraine Army's quote-unquote creeping offensive sparked recent and serious escalation in eastern Ukraine along the front lines, which endangers an already shaky ceasefire. A well-known rebel commander in the war in Ukraine, who went by the nom de guerre of Givi, was killed in his office by a rocket, reportedly by an RPG-like Schmel flamethrower rocket. The Donetsk People's Republic called it a terrorist attack by the Kiev government via a, quote, Ukrainian sabotage reconnaissance group, unquote. Another commander, known as Motorola, was killed last October by a bomb set off in an elevator in his apartment building. And last Saturday, Oleg Anishenko, the head of the military police in the other separatist region, the Luhansk People's Republic, was blown up in his car in the middle of town. The Ukraine SBU denied involvement in the latest assassinations. The Russian government said that the killing was an attempt to destabilize the situation where fighting had escalated in recent weeks on the front lines. Moving on to the United States African Command, Mohamed Abdulli Mohamed, nicknamed Farmaggio, like the Italian word for cheese, Farmaggio, is now the president of Somalia after a surprise win in the election this week. Mr. Cheese, an English version of his nickname, is a technocrat and a former prime minister. Characteristics which will make the West very happy. He's an American and a Somalian. And according to the BBC, he, quote, returned from the U.S. only last year to announce his candidacy. He was first posted to the Somali embassy in Washington in the 1980s and was studying in the U.S. when the Civil War started in 1991 and he claimed political asylum. The election was held after months of delays. 329 new members of parliament, operating from a high security compound at an airport, chose the president from a list of candidates, including the incumbent and 21 other candidates. The capital city of Mogadishu was on lockdown the day before the election and a curfew was imposed afterwards. These security measures were carried out by African Union peacekeepers. The new parliament members themselves were chosen by 14,000 clan elders and other selected regional figures. Because of the unrest in the country, the original plan to allow all adult citizens to vote was abandoned by Western backers, but it's still considered to be an important step toward democracy. The UN Special Representative for Somalia, Michael Keating, called it a, quote, political process with electoral features, unquote. The insurgent group, Al-Shabaab, which is affiliated with Al-Qaeda and once ruled most of the country, said that every person involved in the election was an apostate. The Guardian interviewed various Somalians, some of whom were happy to be witnessing an electoral process for the first time as they watched on television. Others spoke of widespread corruption, where candidates or their foreign backers from the West and the Middle East bought the votes of the Parliament members. And now on to the United States Pacific Command. Things have been heating up between the U.S. and China of late. President Trump's advisor, Stephen Bannon, stirred things up by making a comment about inevitable war with China in the next five to ten years. Bannon said, quote, We're going to war in the South China Sea, no doubt. A Chinese army officer also made comments about the inevitability of a U.S.-Chinese war. This became the topic of numerous headlines and news articles as people try to predict the nature of Trump's foreign policy. The Russian ambassador to China said that trilateral cooperation between the U.S., China, and Russia, quote, would help stabilize world affairs. And now to the United States Southern Command. Wesley Curtin, the chairman of the Private Sector Council, 
at the Institute of Caribbean Studies in Washington, who also serves as a leader of delegation of South Florida businessmen, reported on a conference he attended this week. The Association of American Chambers of Commerce in Latin America and the Caribbean, a conference called Outlook on the Americas at the Biltmore Hotel in Coral Gables, Florida. The conference was attended by leaders from governments, private sector, and NGOs to talk about trade, investment, commercial, and other development issues in the Americas. Their consensus, according to Curtin, was, quote, the private sector has a critical role to play in the future development of the Latin America and Caribbean region, unquote. Governments who do not accommodate and provide incentives for the private sector to expand are, quote, risking their own peril, unquote. Admiral Kurt Tidd, the head of the U.S. Southern Command, was a keynote speaker. He said that Southcom will need regional partnerships and innovation to fight, quote, threat networks, cartel, gangs, drug trafficking, criminal organizations, violent non-state actors, narco-terrorists, and the like, unquote. Some of them are, quote, globally integrated enterprises that rival Fortune 500 companies and have a worldwide reach, quote. Other networks do cocaine trafficking, extortion and human trafficking, and smuggle precursor chemicals into Mexico to make heroin and fentanyl. And some of them, quote, reap enormous profits by illegally mining gold in Guyana, Peru, and Colombia. These networks, quote, threaten the prosperity and security of our hemisphere, Kidd said. The U.S. wants to find new ways to work together with its partner nations, allies, and NGOs, academia, and the private sector to, quote, harness technologies and create innovation partnerships, unquote. Kidd emphasized that security and economic prosperity go hand in hand, and these efforts will also be good for the U.S. and Latin American businesses. Curtin and Tidd had an exchange about the, quote, recent discovery of significant oil reserves within Guyana's geographic space and Venezuela's allegedly aggressive role to claim that oil. Tid told Curtin that, quote, Guyana has solid partners in the hemisphere on its side and could pursue the development of its oil industry with confidence. And finally, to the United States Northern Command, the home front, Rumors have been flying that Secretary of State Rex Tillerson will name the infamous neoconservative Elliot Abram as his number two man at the Department of State, which would be an indication that the neocon warhawks would still have significant power in the Trump administration. Abrams was an assistant Secretary of State during the Reagan administration. He served in George W. Bush's National Security Council staff as a Middle East director. Daniel DePetris at the National Interest Online enumerated some of the reasons why this would be a disastrous appointment. Abrams was a fierce opponent of detente with the Soviet Union some decades ago during his days as a Democrat on the Moynihan staff, and during the 2016 election, he denounced Trump's foreign policy ideas as dangerous to American exceptionalism. Abrams pleaded guilty to Iran-Contra crimes, but George H.W. Bush pardoned him. Eric Alterman at The Nation, who's written about Abrams since 1987, said that he's a full-fledged war criminal, far beyond Kissinger and Cheney. And the Iran-Contra affair was, quote, only the tip of a colossal iceberg, unquote. Alterman said that in 2002, Abrams encouraged the military coup against the democratically elected Hugo Chavez government in Venezuela, short-lived coup. In 2006, he worked to subvert the results of elections in the Palestinian territories, which undermined any possibility of a democratic peace between Israel and the Palestinians. And in the 1980s, quote, Abrams sought to ensure that General Efrain Rios Montt, Guatemala's then dictator, could carry out acts of genocide. On Friday, February 10th, CNN reported that, according to Republican sources, Trump had removed Abrams from the list of contenders. The sources were disappointed about the decision and said it was purely because of Trump's, quote, thin skin and nothing else, unquote, since Abrams had harshly criticized Trump during the election campaign. It is also possible that Abrams was not a contender 
And the whole thing was a media campaign by Abrams and his allies. Certainly seen that before. And in our interview today, we talked to Robbie Martin about this very subject, the role of neoconservatives in the new Trump administration. was around the empire today we're joined by robbie martin filmmaker behind the series a very heavy agenda how's it going robbie great hi robbie how you doing how are you so so the reason we wanted to have you on the show is because of your exhaustive research and study of the neocons and the fact that it looks like certainly with news today that victoria newland was not going to be getting um i guess kept on. And by the way, for those who are following this story, what happened was what happened was that is that people at the state department all submit their resignations. And then sometimes basically the president can decide to accept them. So Victoria Newland and these other people who got uh, purged today submitted their resignations for the new administration. And what was surprising was Trump just accepted them all. <laughs> so none of them are returning to, to service. And so Victoria, Victoria Newland was one of the people who was not returned, who was controversially involved in the Ukraine. And one of the other things that I've noticed is there's a piece by uh, Josh Rogan of the Washington Post, a neocon journalist, called Trump Could Cause the Death of Think Tanks as We Know Them. Uh, and he seems to take the position that uh, Trump's appointments have so far been heavy on business executives and former military leaders, transition successes. He talked to Neither the Enterprise Institute's John Bolton nor the Council on Foreign Relations Richard Haas are likely to be chosen. And then they have, he says um, a blind quote here. This is the death of think tanks as we know them in D.C. <laughs> the people around Trump view think tanks as a sale for the highest bidder. And he talks to <laughs> other neocons like Daniela Pletka and others you know, at the American Enterprise Institute. So it seems like Trump is actually based on the Victoria Newland non-rehire, I guess, and the shutting out of the neoconservative think tanks is the war on neocons or is it is a conflict that we had long talked about robbie is that actually happening i think yeah in part yes for sure but i don't think that it's happening i guess in the most ideal way because uh we already see trump employing things that a lot of neocons not necessarily were for because there was never like a ban muslim immigration ban during bush but that mentality uh trump is already you know sort of putting things into place so i see it as like good and bad because you know after trump got in uh, and won the election i started exploring sort of this rift or split among neoconservatives in dc who started you know their main thing was project for the new american century and there were neocons like frank gaffney um, james woolsey john bolton um, William Bennett, who were never on the stop Trump bandwagon that Bill Crystal kind of kickstarted. And I think that a lot of that more Islamophobic, sort of more authoritarian, I'm looking for another word that, you know, I'm trying not to use the word fascist, you know, <laughs> it's overused right now, but that that sort of, you know, in, in a very heavy agenda, there's a part of part three that I sh try to show how a lot of what Trump is taking were aspects of sort of this bloodthirsty nationalism that the neocons sort of threw out there after 9-11. And even though the neocons hated him for all these reasons, like wanting to pull out of NATO and buddying up to Russia and, and you know, shitting on the Iraq war legacy at the same time, I mean, I don't think Trump would have been able to get where he is without the the way being paved for him by the neocons. But um, here's a here's a question on that. And I agree with yeah, and that's that's a good part of how he kind of re-engineered their their imperialism to kind of be tougher than they were. But what's interesting that you I thought really focused on that everybody else seemed to have missed, just about how power works in Washington, was you focused on the think tank set. You you focused of this kind of 
public but not much studied layer of power in D.C., which is the Institute for the Study of War, the American Enterprise Institute, how they get these think tanks together and these letter writing campaigns, which seemingly would be nothing because there's, you know, people on the sidelines put, put petitions out all the time and no one gives a shit. But people who are inside D.C. apparently write these letters like PNAC and it matters. And it seems like while Trump is definitely more of a populist and anti-elite, anti-establishment, He's also shutting out that tier that you studied, or do you don't see it that way? Well, no, I think he's definitely creating a very narrow path for which some of these think tank people can navigate him. You know, sp- specifically people like Gaffney with his Center for Security of American Policy, I think it's called his his basically his whole counter jihad organization, uh, you know, is is a think tank, but it's it's definitely not in the same category as the stuff that i studied and i and I, yeah i mean you're you're completely right you know think tanks like the atlantic council some of these especially the think tanks that center around sort of our response in europe and with nato um i think that they are um, going to be scrambling uh for work right now um but at the same time though i mean i think the other angle here that's possible is i i think at any moment this sort of detente with russia could um you know go in the reverse direction and all that has to happen is trump has to have someone around him or you know even putin himself slight him or you know try to manipulate a situation and i think the whole thing will go south very quickly and trump might actually you know need some of those think tanks guidance these ones that were trying to ratchet up the cold war that he claims he wants to sort of you know dial down now i i think you know right now that's what we're seeing but i still think we're you know, these think tanks will still be looking for work and their advice um, might still be needed in the future by his administration. Oh, so you've t- okay, this is interesting. Is there, one of the things about Trump and about the current situation that's always fascinating is the different perceptions and analysis of what people think is the actual, like, dynamics. So there's people, for example, which you seem to be agreeing with, which is the dynamic that Trump is this loose cannon he doesn't know what he's doing. He's he's all gut. You know, he's, it's all like reactionary. And then there's other people who, it's funny, both pe- people on both sides of this, some people say he's Putin's puppet and it's ridiculous. And then there's other people who seem to think that, well, Trump blusters a lot. He actually does have a core policy agenda, which is the realist school of foreign policy, which is, you know, America does not, it's not going to be liberal interventionist, but it's going to be very nationalistic. And from and that's the reason in their mind that he has sees a commonality with Putin, or at least some of his advisors do, because they see Putin as returning Russia to a traditional sphere of influence, which the U.S. has no real problem with because the U.S. doesn't want to police the entire world anymore or have this. So your interpretation is not that there's some larger agenda here and that yours is that, you know, Trump only likes Putin or mostly likes Putin because Putin was very complimentary of him, not because he sees common interests with Russia's power politics. No, I definitely think I I'm of two minds. I think, I definitely think it's um, the last thing you said plays a huge role as well. I think Trump is simultaneously a loose cannon and he could, you know, be emotionally driven at any moment, but he also does have um, some sort of core foreign policy values. It seems because you know, even though during the campaign, I thought a lot of the stuff he was saying about the Iraq war, especially was strategic sort of playing on this more general angst, you know, he never, he never went after the Iraq war for moral reasons necessarily, but now he's sort of bringing up more of this idea of not making America, you know, the world in America's image that where it's America first. So that's definitely, you know, not just a strategic power play that's it seems like something he actually believes and i don't know if it was uk prime minister who sort of announced this new union between the us and the uk in with this mindset yeah that was today Theresa may Theresa may said that today and it's it's interesting because trump gave an interview with i believe dave mir of abc news uh last night and his position is and this is why it's so hard to pin down is he says basically the world is so screwed up The world is so crazy. It's so out of control that we just got to focus on ourselves because we can't even handle it. It's so out of control. Now, 
on the one hand, you would think that's a very non-interventionist view because he's saying he's America first because he can't do all these other things because other people are too crazy. But you're you're saying, and I think what a lot of people fear, I think this is a legitimate thing to think about because it is so dangerous, is, yeah, he says that now, but if someone really gets under his skin or he really gets feels his ego has been bruised, he's going to do something crazy. Is that kind of – like he has a plan to be more, uh, I guess, de minimis in U.S. power and more – very focused and realist and and pragmatic about what can be achieved and to focus on America first. But you're saying that you think if he gets slighted, <laughs> he might just drop all that <laughs> and go hard. Is that, it's, is that it's possible or, or maybe he, you know, maybe he will look, try to provoke some kind of confrontation with, I mean, and the, and the main one that worries me is with Iran. I mean, that's, that already seem we already see sort of, little baby steps in that direction right now um, trying to lump in, you know, Iranian refugees or, or whatever with like Syrian refugees. Like he's basically trying to create this false equivalency that, you know, all these terrorists come from Iran um, just like they come from like Sudan and these other countries, you know, that have more actual, you know, you know, Al Qaeda or whatever from them. So that, I mean, that's the thing that worries me most. I don't, I, I, I mean, I maybe perhaps the way I described it is a little more cartoony, but I have to admit, after what I've seen of Trump do with his, you know, first few days in office, um, it it has actually really scared me more than I thought that it would. <laughs> and I mean, in particular, his, I mean, just if we're going to stay on topic, his his ban of all the, you know, refugees and granting visas to all these supposed terrorist nations, which is you know, sort of under the, it's basically the Muslim immigration ban light under the guise of just banning certain, you know, specific nation states. And of course he doesn't include Saudi Arabia on there, which is kind of, I think is a bad sign. You know, it sh- it kind of shows that his rhetoric on Saudi Arabia was probably more strategic going into the campaign. And now that he's in office, it's more about places like Iran. It has a little bit more of a neoconservative flavor to it. But is it now that's an interesting point because one way you could look at that is that is what you describe, but you could also tailor it or or see it in a context of for, this is perhaps depressing about our country, but I'll say it anyway. The Muslim ban pulled higher than Trump, meaning more people supported the Muslim ban than were publicly at least willing to say that they supported Donald Trump. So is the Muslim ban a, a response to this kind of xenophobic core conviction of his or is he playing to the cheap seats with a policy that has a lot of popularity i mean i haven't seen a lot of people be that upset about the muslim ban other than people like us who don't like islamophobia or don't want a society based on demonizing people based on race or don't want an immigration policy based solely on religion a religious test the poll i mean he that was not one of his more on you know vilification of mexicans or as mexican americans was one thing but that muslim ban pulled very high so i wonder if it's just not cynical populism rather than he's got this determination to prevent a certain group of people from becoming americans i mean is that is that at all persuasive or no well he also framed it he said not all muslims muslim countries where they're plotting you know attacks against us so he he did frame it in such a way to make it a more popular thing, I think, too. That's probably one of the reasons why there hasn't been as much pushback as we expected. And then he put Iran into there. And as far as I know, have any Iranian terrorists uh, plotted no, I mean, attacks there's, on there's... American soil? Well, well, that would, well, they will throw Beirut into that. So I guess I that's, guess. that's the reasoning on that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say. I mean, this is the fundamental problem with Trump. How many of his policies or his stated policies or the, you know, just the things he throws out there, the wild statements are actually things he believes or things that he's doing to play on fear because I think he's been really good at that. But I, I mean, I think a lot of this goes back to, you know, just this notion that illegal immigration or immigration in general is linked with, with terrorism. Um, that's a relatively new sort of, right wing talking point merging of those two issues. I, I say relatively recent, you know, mm. only over the last couple of years, which is really fascinating to me that, you know, that those were actually two separate issues for a very long time. And so I, I think some, a lot of this actually came from Frank Gaffney, 
one of you know Trump's supposed shadow advisors. But at the same time, you're you're right, Daniel. I don't, I I honestly can't say. But if I were to guess, I would say that he believes it more than he's just playing on people's fears or you know playing on how he thinks the public, uh, what the public believes. Well, and it also could you could look at it as a media story, and that Trump's media, ironically, his media consciousness does extend beyond the United States. So the tying of terrorism and immigration isn't really true in the United States, but it's absolutely true in Europe, where a lot of famous attacks, this is kind of the worrisome part about Trump that I think does harken back to George W. Bush. Because in the sense that Bin Laden and Bush wanted each other, they kind of needed each other, they were useful foils for each other. Trump and ISIS are a very, have a kind of dark dialogue and they want to keep, you know what I mean? Like he, they raise the envelope and he kind of likes it to respond to it or uses it to respond to it. So there were these attacks in France. And there, of course, was a, a very, from all things considered, relative, you know, keeping things in proportion, an attack in San Bernardino that was not that significant. And he, man, did he latch onto that. And he really liked that frame of reference as a tool. So it's kind of it's kind of like he reaches out and touches the media consciousness, which it did, in, of course, include the famous attack in Paris that killed, uh, I think, over 100 people at the Eagles of Death Metal show. And so I wonder if that's – it's the media – he seems to be so driven by media, meaning how he – even today, you know, he's responding to tweets. He's attacking journalists. He, his, his chief advisor, Steve Bannon, who is from Breitbart News, says the media is the real opposition party. He said that today in the New York Times – and that, you know, they need to understand they've been humiliated and they need to understand they don't know America and that we're going to be running, you know, a White House that sees the, the media journalism as an enemy. And I wonder if that's also a big part of what's driving his Islamophobia is that these re- reports were such big news stories during 2016. And he and he's sort of saying, I'm going to keep running with this because this seems to have worked for me. Do you think that's part? Do you think the media is part of that? equation or you think it's like a sort of deep-seated more deep-seated islamophobia i don't really know the answer i'm just wondering what your perception is i mean i again i think it's it's both i mean you could go back to what he did with the with the central park five and ask the same question you know i mean he wasn't even running for office back then but was he deep-seated you know uh racist on some level or was he just doing that to gain some kind of weird, you know, outrage fame, you know, I mean, what, what would you even call that? Like negative fame? Well, actually, no, a lot of people liked what he did, actually, in New York, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, like that he took ads. I mean, didn't he actually take ads out in the paper as well? He held, a, he held a press conference, despite not holding any public office to condemn the Central Park Five later proved uh not to have been the guilty parties and said, you know, and then the press who was at that time giving him a lot more deference because he was not a political candidate. He was a famous developer in the city. He had great parties. So they were kind of like, well, you know, you know, relax kind of hinting. Like, doesn't this sound like you hate them? Which is basically like, you know, you sound racist. And he said, I do hate them. I hate what they do. I hate anyone who would do this. I think they should be executed. So (laughs) you're right. That's a good parallel. So maybe the Muslim demonization that we're seeing or saw during the campaign are seeing now is a sort of ugly populism, the ugly side of populism, which is that, it, you know, people, the mob wants blood. And there's definitely, I agree. It's actually a good parallel because that, you know, the central park five were extremely unpopular among the population and Muslims in America outside of a few pockets of support and sympathy are generally kind of considered the enemy of the United States or they've treated that way at least. But that's that's an interesting point. Yeah, I guess that is maybe that is the correct way to interpret Trump. I mean, we're all trying to figure out what's next for him. But I guess what question I want to ask you, since your film series is so exhaustive on this, and it's a great film series for those who are listening, is what do you think's next for the neocons now that Trump is there? I mean, he's there for four years, barring an impeachment. <laughs> well, that's that's the question, isn't it? Um, I mean, there was another article that came out after that Josh Rogan article about the death of think tanks that was, I think it was in the Washington post wasn't by Rogan, but it was them interviewing a bunch of neocons who had signed this series of letters anonymously 
um, specifically that war on the rocks letter that I talk about in a very heavy agenda. Some of them went on record like Elliot Cohen and he sort of, you know, described again his experience being told that he's not wanted or, or something like that. He was told by a Trump cabinet member. Uh, but there were a bunch of other people quoted in it who were kind of like that the general theme of the article was, we know we messed up. We, th- you know, we, we went along with this at the time because we were really worried, you know, about what he was going to do. But now that um, he's in there, like we we're still sort of, here's an olive branch. Like we, we want, we want to let people know that we're here and waiting around still, and we're still willing to work with Trump. And I found that really interesting because it's like, you know, I mean, we've seen people like Romney and stuff kind of come groveling back to Trump, but I think that the, we're going to, going to see more neocons doing it in public. I think this is sort of the first step. Um, and, and I guess it'll just depend on if Trump is, is actually going to listen and be willing to take their advice. I wouldn't be surprised if Bill Kristol and Trump had a meeting at some point. You know, maybe Trump will insult him or, you know, call him an asshole to his face. But it, but I, I think that's in the cards at some point. And I don't know what moment or sort of shift is going to take place to make that happen. But I definitely think they're in a, a far weaker position now. There's no question about that. Well, it's what you studied and we talked about this and it was in our conversations in the run up was it wasn't just that they were worried about Trump. It was that they were convinced he was going to lose. And they, in a sort of strategic fashion, jumped ship. Bob Kagan led the way, and his wife is not going to be working in the Trump administration, we now know, despite being a career you know, State Department official. Um, and it seems like the, the problem is they, they, they miscalculated, and they ran to the Democratic Party. But the Democratic Party isn't, is not only not in the White House, they're not running anything. They are not running the Senate. They are not running the House. They do not control, not that it would matter to foreign policy, most state legislatures. They don't control most governorships. They are on the verge of essentially being a municipal party. So they're kind of, they kind of took the exact worst position, which was to you know, not only abandon the, the Republican nominee, but kind of vilify people who stuck around as, as people without principles, and people who had no, and in fact, they used it for an opportunity for themselves to virtue signal. So I agree that Trump might do the kind of Mitt Romney, <laughs> if you try to reach this, try to jump and try to reach this <laughs> routine, <laughs> take him out to a few humiliating dinners. <laughs> but I'm not sure if, if there's actually going to be a rapprochement in the sense that they actually bring them in. Because remember, the people running the store are Michael Flynn, National Security Advisor. You know, Steve Bannon and all these generals who were cashiered under Obama. So, and plus, I, I think it's also they'd have to bend over. So, I mean, so hard. I mean, like there's the things Max Boot and Bill Crystal, and I mean, they didn't just say he was not their preferred candidate. They said he was, you know, manifestly unqualified, unworthy of presidential power. <laughs> so it's kind yeah, of hard. called him a fascist too. You called him a fascist. You called him a Frankenstein. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's hard to come back from that, isn't it? I don't see how he ever trusts them. I mean, he's never going to forget that. Yeah, I mean, I I think that the Kagans are are mostly done. I think the only people that have a chance still to navigate uh, Trump administration is, is Kim and Fred Kagan, um, because they you know the Institute for Study of War has managed to, to take on this sort of unopinionated. Uh, you know, it appears to be some kind of neutral, just data gathering, you know, war study think tank. So I could see someone like Flynn going to them for some kind of specific task in the future. But, you know, the rest of the Kagan family, um, Newland, Robert Kagan, I think that they're done. And I think that that's good. But Right. That's that's why it's so bittersweet, isn't it? Yeah. And we were talking a little earlier, um, Joanne mentioned she had read um some of Flynn's book which is co-authored by Michael Ledeen and and that's I mean that's another part of this equation that really really concerns me because Michael Ledeen is not you know I do think Robert Kagan is is uh, narcissistic I think he's you know he's egotistical 
he's he scares me the things he believes but michael ledean scares me a lot more based on just just his past statements i mean you know and i'm and i think you know i don't know how insane michael ledean was before 911 and whether it was 911 that sort of activated something in him but the things that he said on record i i mean they terrify me deeply that anybody in a position of power could think that way um and i think that that's the part of neoconservatism <laughs> neoconservatism that i think we will see carried over in the trump administration is this almost egomaniacal thirst for power especially if another terrorist attack you know like 9 and 11 hopefully it doesn't happen but if something like that happens i think that's the moment where you know we're going to see something really frightening and possibly even more frightening than george w bush yeah so his book with ladine was published in july and i don't know a lot about ladine but as far as how far back these sort of policies uh, and beliefs go. I mean, he was involved in Iran Contra, so that gives you some idea. He was apparently he was a consultant to Robert McFarland. So the book is somewhat. A lot of people have expressed the fact that there are two completely different foreign policy ideologies in this book. That Ladine is definitely neocon, and that Flynn is realist. A uh, one guy from Brookings said that. Flynn is is a realist, but like with neocon tendencies, if he took his own sort of core beliefs or what he says are core beliefs all the way to to their logical end, he would be a neocon. And but it's a pretty incoherent book because uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. So they basically say that we need to be prepared for a multi-decade long war against terrorism and use all use our military power, diplomacy, economic assistance. He does focus a lot. He says that the U.S. doesn't know enough about its enemies because we don't collect enough intelligence. So all throughout it, apparently, there's, he goes back to a, a very logical message about, you know, a better knowledge of our enemies and better collection of and use of intelligence and better working together of the different intelligence agencies. And even when Flynn spoke about the book, he said, you know, it seems incoherent that what he's trying to say is that there's a set of enemies, big enemies, and those are a set of enemy countries. And then he appends onto them Al Qaeda, ISIS, and Hezbollah. And he admits that this group of enemies that is working in concert, he says, have differing, like completely drastically differing ideologies. But he believes that their contempt for democracy and their contempt for the United States allows them to overcome their ideological differences. And then I'll tell you how, in another way, he completely completely wrecks that, that whole idea that ideologies can be overcome to focus on a common enemy. And I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. So he says that the, the enemy countries are, where are they? They're like North Korea, China, Syria, Cuba, Libya, Venezuela. Nicaragua and Russia, but Iran is the centerpiece of all of it. And then he tacks Al Qaeda, ISIS, and Hezbollah onto that. And you know, as you know, that's a very big mix of different. You've got communist countries in there. You've got, and then he goes on about the you know the strategy of how to win. He keeps saying also big focus on well we need to win this time, and that's I think where that we need to win our wars comes from with Trump. So you can hear a bit of Flynn with the intelligence issue. You can hear Flynn with, we need to go back and win those wars that, you know, that we lost, that were the, were the, the main centerpiece of my career. And then you can see Ladine in there with the Iran is the root of all evil. They call for a beefing up our military, beefing up everything. They call for a multi-decade war every, you know anywhere and it's all focused on radical islam they also say that one of the things they want to do where is that they they want to do a reformation of islam oh my god i'm not kidding and um so some of the criticisms of it i mean ladine has said things like 
he wants to turn the whole region, Middle East region, into a cauldron. And faster, please. I think he's famous for that quote. He's getting his wish. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a pretty scary book, I would say. The steps he has, like, they're, they're sort of like four steps. First is beef up everything. You know, pour more money into the military especially, but other things too. He's very big on, we should wage this war the same way we fought communism. We should have a cold war. In other words, they sort of agree... I think one of one of the main clashes that might be going on goes back to the whole thing about the Asian pivot, Obama's Asian pivot. And that might even be their gripe with the neocons. They had sort of started to focus too much on Russia, where they're like, whoa, 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 let's stay back here in the Middle East. And they really don't want to pivot away from the Middle East. So just to throw that into it. But anyway, so the first step is beef up everything. Number two, they say engage Islamic extremists wherever they are and help countries fight them, which that's not a whole lot of change from today. And then number three I thought was interesting. They said compel state and non-state actors who support terrorists to make them stop. So that's obviously uh, Saudi Arabia, I think. I don't know. They don't specify who. And then the last one is they say wage an ideological war against radical Islam. In other words, fight it like we fought communism. And there's a quote here. We want the world to see that we are effective and determined to prevail. If they see it, those who share our values will join with us to win this global war. Oh my I don't God. think we can win without our allies. I mean, that sounds just like uh, Bush, right? I mean, yeah, this is all, this is all Bush rehash crap. I mean, Robbie, you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, this is the weird thing about Flynn is apparently, you know, he subscribes to sort of the more Russian or anti-Syrian intervention point of view in Syria. But almost everything else that he's spoken on um, is is very Bush like. I mean, when it comes to foreign policy, um, I just found a quote from him where he said we should assail isolationism, any form of American withdrawal and the fallacy of moral equivalence, any form of American withdrawal. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's just interesting that Trump it, it has chosen this guy. So I don't know. I mean, you know, some of the, I mean, that, that's another angle to Ladine and of course, Flynn by proxy. I mean, we've already seen some of the bizarre tweets he's um, posted about how fear of Muslims is rational, something that Flynn tweeted. Um, we saw his son get sucked down the pizza gate rabbit hole. Um, that all got exposed. Is that that was his son, right? Wasn't it, Daniel? Yes, it was. That was yeah. his son yeah. tweeting yeah. about Pizzagate. So we have actually a dangerous merger here happening between conspiracy theory culture, neoconservative uh, mentality, and like this sort of Islamophobic, you know, mindset. Well, and, and Rob, as you know, and Robbie, as you know, when Joanne going through that medley of incoherence but also some coherence i couldn't help but thinking back to um that adam curtis documentary and the way they talked about actually not it wasn't adam curtis documentary it was called the spike it was this book i think it might have been adam curtis i will fact check it but it was this book called the spike and there was this theory that soviet the soviet union was actually behind all terrorism in the world even if it wasn't communist yeah that it, that it all went back to the Soviet Union. And so it's like it, they've replaced, because Russia is now not communist in it, as, you know, Christian-esque, I guess, it's a little bit more Western, right? That's some of the affinity between the alt-right and Russia. Um, you also have, well, now Iran is the, is the hell mouth. Yeah. Yeah, is that, is that, a, is that, would that make sense in the neocon worldview, Robbie, that Iran has now replaced the Soviet Union as the hell mouth and that even though there's all these disparate elements, even though it's Sunni jihadism, which really is sponsored by Saudi Arabia. Um, it's Iran is this new grand evil. Absolutely. And and there were elements of the Bush administration that were trying to push that as well, claiming that all the Iraq insurgency came from Iran. And, and, you know, look at all these Iranian weapons. I mean, that was an angle being pushed heavily in the Bush administration. Uh, it never really, you know, got... You know, it, it never really got locked in completely, um, but I think that we're going to see. Yeah, I completely agree with you that it, it is sort of going to replace 
Russia as the source of all terrorist acts happening all over the world. And, you know, I don't know how much of Woolsey's influence or Bolton's influence got to Trump, but they're, they're completely fixated on Iran. Surprise. And it was funny when you, because you're talking about how he attacked people in the primaries, fellow Republicans. What was interesting is during the Iraq, the Iraq attacks, it wasn't about, I mean, he did talk about loss of life and he did talk about wasted money, but one of the things he would hit his Republican rivals with was he would say, look what happened. Iran took over Iraq. You empowered the greater enemy, essentially, without saying it like that. And I wonder if that didn't split the Hawks a little bit. Because the Hawks, if you really think Iran is a great danger, and you hear Trump attack these people for saying not only was Iraq a disaster and mistake, but it actually because of the human costs and the monetary costs, but you actually ended up empowering an even greater enemy than Saddam. You see what I'm saying? That he's kind of he's trying yeah. to cutting it both ways. He's he's posturing strong, and he's also playing the neocons game against themselves by saying, not only did you do this terrible thing, but it was a mistake because you empowered the greater enemy. So it actually maybe that does set up a very anti-Iranian strategy. And also, I mean, he said he doesn't like the Iran nuclear deal and he wants to stop it. Well, if he stops the Iran nuclear deal, let's be clear. Iran is going to go back to refining uranium for atomic weapons. And we know that things like Olympic Games, Stuxnet doesn't work because they've, they have counteractions and they've been able to develop it even after it was happening. And we, and the only thing question I would have is, it seemed like the Obama administration restrained Israel from actually b- taking military action. Would Trump even try to do that? No, that's, and that's, that's a whole other, you know, thing that I don't think people are discussing enough. I mean, look what happened during uh, Reagan's presidency with Iraq. Israel attacked a, a nuclear, um, what was it? A nuclear. Yeah. yeah. So I think we are completely primed for a situation like that happening. There's zero evidence that Trump has any problem whatsoever with Israel's increasingly aggressive behavior, not just to its neighbors, but to its, you know, to Palestinians. But back to what you were saying about this, I do think there there have been several little rifts that have taken place in the neoconservative movement. I mean, one of the earliest ones that I noticed after Bush was this sort of overpowering Islamophobia. That some that turned some neocons off, like Francis Fukuyama. Um, he criticized Bill Crystal to his face, saying that some you know neocons were too influenced by the Israeli hardline right, who basically thought that Arabs only understand force. But the Iran equation was uh, something that split off some neocons. I remember a friend of mine, John Gold, was interviewing a neoconservative named John Kay. Who, who was part of the think tank, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. And he, he asked him, he's like, would you consider yourself a neoconservative? You know, because at that time, I think it's like three or four years ago, it was a very taboo word. And he said, no, because the inevitable result of what is currently neoconservatism is a military overthrow of, the, of Iran, of the government of Iran. And I thought that was almost it was another kind of frank admission that maybe, you know, at a certain point, certain neocons had gotten too extreme and they were still fixated on that. And I think we've sort of seen that rift, uh, you know, kind of widen over time where you had people, you know, Eli Lake, for example, or Jamie Kerchick, they seem to throw out hints about how they want, you know, to take down Iran, not really, you know, aggressive statements necessarily, but they'll definitely plant the seeds for it and talk about it. But then you have, you know, people like Bolton and, and James Woolsey and Ledeen and Frank Gaffney, who are very open um, about their fixation towards, you know, doing something to Iran. Also, Mattis as well. You know, right. some of some of Trump's cabinet, they're very focused on Iran. That's one of my biggest concerns. Oh, yeah. And he um, and what did he do? Just did a bunch of bombing already. After his first, I don't know, week in office of ISIS. He's done, yeah, he's done bombing. He's done drone strikes. He's issued drone strike orders in Yemen. I mean, uh, that this is a key point because it's it's so weird. And you almost, I mean, I'm not that conspiratorial, but you almost wonder, after all this fighting with the neocons, after all this back and forth, after all these 
petty and major arguments and vilifications, they're going to get their war with Iran. <laughs> I mean, isn't that, wouldn't that be the ultimate irony that after all this posturing and infighting and yeah. careers destroyed, that at the end of it, there is a U.S. war with Iran? And that's when the, these think tanks step back in. This is when the Foreign Policy Initiative and the Foundation for Defense of Democracies especially will be right there front and center throwing another olive branch out to Trump. And, and, and he might accept it at that point. I think it's likely he would at that. That's when their interests would be aligned. Or if he wants to confront China in some way. Um, well, the, the book, one of the criticisms of it is that you know, even though China and North Korea were listed as one of the top enemies, it, it doesn't address Asia or Latin America at all in terms of, you know, how do, how do we win and laying out a strategy? So uh, maybe they just didn't, maybe they left that material for another book. Maybe it would have been too much or but they did not include a strategy yeah, that now, addressed Asia or Latin America. Yeah, it is. It is. I want to go back to Mattis for a second because What's so interesting about him is I saw a lot of libertarian people who were sort of like, oh, this guy seems like he kind of checks out. Like he might actually, you know, look at the things he's saying about Syria and, and all these things. And then all of a sudden, like Infowars and, and other websites like that are running stories sort of praising Mattis's bombing. And I, I, I'm just I'm a little bit confused about how so many libertarians got into Trump in the first place. But now I feel like a lot of them should you know, see what's going on. There's no, I mean, did you notice how there wasn't even talk about freedom or, or just like, you know, preserving like constitutional rights in his inaugural speech? I mean, it was all about, it, it wasn't, it, I mean, just from a libertarian uh, perspective in that regard, there was, it doesn't seem to be anything that Trump is projecting like that. So I didn't I hear know. much about the constitution that, that surprised me. Well, I'm glad to see at least Rand Paul is uh, saying he's going to stand up to some of this stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, you do have to wonder if libertarianism, I mean, just as a side, I mean, there's some actual very consistent libertarians on this stuff. I think antiwar.com and sure. Scott Horton, and there's a lot of really wonderful people out there who are very consistent are actually anti-imperialist. But that a libertarian could, it could rally around a guy like Trump, who's not just a foreign policy Sure, he's nationalist and a bit realistic, but he's also in the domestic policy, probably one of the more – I mean, he, he championed – it was so funny. They set all these traps for him during the primary, and at one point they tried to entrap him with eminent domain, which, by the way, is like one of the like one of the most offensive things possible to libertarians, that the government oh, yeah. would take your property. And Trump defended it and said, not only should – not only is it good, not only have I done it, but I would support it. It's important. You wouldn't even have a country if you didn't do that. And also he's, you know, building a big wall, which libertarians are supposed to be these people who don't believe in walls. So that, that the Trump libertarian alliance, my only thing I can come up with is that they just hate the mainstream conservatives so much, they're just really getting off and watching them eat shit. That's really my only <laughs> kind of visceral. I don't know if you have a better take on that, the Trump libertarian alliance. I don't know. It's just it's just interesting to me that a lot of this talk about him you know criticizing the iraq war and and jabbing you know jeb bush over 9 11 and stuff i i do think i mean it even appealed to me at the time um me too I, so i think i i think that's probably what sucked a lot of those people in so I don't. he's know. like a conglomerate he's got bits and pieces for all different constituencies it's almost yeah. like you know, somebody was coming up with his strategy. I think some of them were inherent. You could just tell when he blurts them out. But other ones were definitely, you know, constructed. Yeah, and what it, what was the thing announced today about how they're going to actually start reporting stats on crimes illegal immigrants commit in the country? They're going to highlight them at uh, press conferences now? I thought that was really interesting because it almost seems like that's what the Drudge Report, you know, does. <laughs> that's I mean, that's... Yeah that's been the function of like Matt Drudge's whole thing for decades. Pretty much. There's a, there's a section of, of Breitbart news that's dedicated. I forget. I don't want to mispronounce. It's like black crime or it, it's kind of like a race crime. I mean, there, it's, there's, it's such a staple, even though it's statistically not really that prevalent. And I'm actually Trump got in trouble during the campaign for retweeting a white nationalist who put up phony statistics about black on white crime 
And then he just sort of said, whatever, I, you know, <laughs> it's my facts. I mean, you don't know. We don't know what the real numbers are. <laughs> See, that's just, that defense is so useful because it just, he just dismissed the press no matter what they say. Well, we don't know what the real numbers are right? with unemployment. It's probably and at 40%. <laughs> and that's when the press, um, and I think that's when the press totally, you know, gets sucked into like, you know, they fix it on that one lie. It's so absurd and ridiculous that they feel the need to keep bringing it up over and over again. But it's like, it doesn't even matter that he did it. Like, ultimately. Or the inauguration crowds. Who cares? This isn't a non-story. But since he keeps harping on it, they keep harping on it. Meanwhile, he's doing all this other stuff behind the scenes. And, every, and nobody even cares. And now he's going to have them running around in circles about illegal voters. In an election he won. I've never seen yeah. someone contest an election they won. Well, they're they're getting they're getting better. I mean, the media trolled him all day on the on like twenty four hours straight on the crowd size, and then when he responded, then they acted like they made a big deal about the fact that he responded. But they they actually they totally provoked that, and I think that's sort of them, you know, all the remorse they went through, whether they didn't realize that they had unintentionally helped him win the primary. I think now they're. They wise up and they know a whole lot better how to get to him. <laughs> better late than never, I guess. Um, okay, well, we've kept you for a while, Robbie. Do you have any final thoughts on this and where people can see your work uh, going forward as we go into the dark ages? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I wanted to bring this up earlier, but I'll, I guess I'll just end with this thought that, you know, you and I had talked about what Trump was going to be like after he actually sat in the office because we were sort of like, well, you know, will he become more presidential, will become more scripted, you know? And then I, I think you were the one who said, no, it'll probably just be like him campaigning, um, like an infinite campaign. And I almost see, I saw that at first and now it seems like he's actually getting weirder. Um, <laughs> that's even possible. Um, so I don't know if you saw this interview with him on ABC news where he's walking through the Oval Office and, he gets up to his desk um, and he opens the letter that Obama left for him and shows and sort of like talks about it with this reporter. Did you see that? Oh, I didn't see that part. No, I didn't see that he opened the letter. It's really fascinating to watch. I just, it's because he cannot stop gloating for the whole, just the whole time. It's just, it's just fascinating. You know, like he's already won and he's still concerned with just winning like at every 30 seconds in this interview. It's, it's really weird. Even he can't believe that he won. Nobody so, can believe it. So just on a psychological level, I, st I mean, I, it's, it's, it's creepy and, and it's just weird that he's, he's sitting in the office and his first presidential portrait came out too. And even that was weird. <laughs> it was very untraditional what he, what he did. He's basically scowling in the picture. Oh no. Oh no. So, it is like that. Yeah, it is like living under an autocrat where, like, you know, you see these things where, like, I forget which country it was. Uh, it might have been Tajikistan or something, or where they had some, like, guy who just created this big moving statue of himself in the town square. And it's like, you always see these kind of weird. Animated like, statue? No, it was, yeah, it was like a move. It would move. It would move. It would face oh, the no. sun always. It was gold. It was made out of oh. gold. And it's like, this is what happens when you have these kind of peculiar autocrats. This is, you saw this a lot in Eastern Europe under so when they were in the Soviet bloc, like Ceausescu and all these other people. Like, they'd have some unlimited power. So they do these weird construction projects that didn't make sense. And so I just, you're right. The what, what you talk about, the may, more, maybe that's the most autocratic part of this whole thing. Because I do think he's going to respect some, or be forced to respect some constitutional boundaries. But it's just like having a kind of eccentric autocratic guy. What do you think? He well, put I mean, a portrait of Andrew Jackson up in the uh, Oval Office, I heard. Yeah, which is which is interesting for a lot of different reasons. Yes, yeah, there he's, are he's a number a, of different he's reasons. A he's a Democrat. He's right. When, I know one thing I forgot to mention that, that I probably should end with, because this is, this is actually legitimately frightening to me, you know, as someone who partakes in, in marijuana, no, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we just um, I think it was a few months ago that president of the Philippines, the guy who's murdered Duarte. Thousands of drug yeah, users, Duarte, um, just on the streets and, and had, you know, soldiers put bags over their heads, almost like, you know, bodies to warn people in the streets, almost like a Mexican drug cartel. The president of the Philippines is doing this. Meanwhile, 
he praises Trump and then Trump praises him back. And yeah. I have a feeling, and this might be, you know, call this fear mongering, but I have a feeling that Trump has been a little too silent on just his general feeling about marijuana, drug policy. All we hear him talk about is drugs coming through the border of Mexico. I haven't heard very much about his, you know, thoughts on decriminalizing drugs, how much he wants to enforce the drug laws, you know, sentencing for drug crimes, like possession of marijuana and things like that. Medical marijuana, uh, you know, states that have legalized marijuana. And just that, I, I think we might see some really draconian policy coming forward. We have to remember Chris Christie, you know, pot was potentially going to be his VP and was his buddy for a while. He was one of the only Republican candidates who made anti-medical marijuana part of his platform. Um, so I don't know, could be the paranoid stoner part of me, but I, I don't know. That worries me quite a lot. No, that's a good, yeah, that's a good point. And, and Trump himself, as we all know, does not use any, doesn't bring do anything. His, his brother died of it uh, when he was younger and, and he does talk about drugs. You're right. He does talk about drugs an awful lot for someone who I don't really know. I mean, I thought part of that was it started at least as a, I think, strategic because he said it in New Hampshire, which has a very high heroin problem. And it was a New Hampshire primary that he talked about cutting heroin out, even though a lot of it's from prescription drugs. But yeah, you might be right. That might, that's, there's something to watch. Definitely something to watch. All right. Thank you so much, Robbie, for coming on the show. Thanks a lot, Rob. It's great talking to you. Where can people see your work? Media uh, Roots Radio? Anywhere else? MediaRoots.org. We, ha- we do a podcast, me and Abby, about twice a month. And then uh, you can check out my film series, A Very Heavy Agenda, at AVeryHeavyAgenda.com. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. All right. Okay. That's our show. Thank you for listening. A uh, special thanks to Robbie Martin, our guest, also the creator of the music in the show. He has a podcast called Media Roots. You can find his documentary films at AVeryHeavyAgenda.com. Please support our show at Patreon.com slash AroundTheEmpire by becoming a patron, which we appreciate so much, as it helps us produce the show and improve our bare-bones setup. You can also do a one-time donation via PayPal using email address dan at shadowproof.com. And you can send us comments and complaints to dan at shadowproof.com. All complaints should be addressed to Dan. (laughs) And uh, you can also read our work at shadowproof.com. So until next time, take care and go well. Mm